Hello, Whiskey Ring podcast listeners. Today we have a special interview. We have on Dr. Edward Slinkerland. He is the Distinguished University Scholar and Professor of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. And most importantly to this conversation, he is the author of Drunk, How We Sipped, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way to Civilization. And when I post this, you will see a picture of all of the sticky notes that I have in this book from reading it and making notes. So Dr. Slingland, welcome and happy to have you on. No, thanks for having me. All right. So um, I've had the benefit, I think, of a little bit of time since the book was initially published uh, last year. And uh, I should note you're coming on now also because right around when this podcast goes live, the book will be coming out in uh, paperback edition. Yep. Um, before we get into the topics, are there any major changes between the two editions or is it just... Uh, it's exactly the same. Yeah. Exactly the yeah. Same. Okay. Yeah. Just have to make sure. All right. So, for um, for those of you who may not know Dr. Slingerlin, he has uh, a quite interesting range of interests. I would say between uh, everything from the Warring States period and ancient China, philosophy, psychology, um, socio history. I mean, a pretty broad range of of interests. So, what led you to writing a book about getting intoxicated towards civilization? Yeah, um, a lot of my colleagues would like to know the answer to that question too. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> baffling, but it, it seems random, but it's actually not. It, it grows pretty, this drunk grows pretty organically out of previous work I've done. So, so for one strain is that, uh, you know, my main specialty is really Chinese philosophy. And from, in my early career, I, I did a lot of work on this concept of wu wei or effortless action in early Chinese thought. So this is a state where you lose a sense of yourself as an agent, not self-conscious, everything flows naturally. It's kind of like being in the zone in sports and everything works out. You're successful, you're charismatic, people like you, uh, you want to be in a state of wu wei. The, the problem is you, how do you, how do you try to be spontaneous? I mean, if you know that you're going to do better in an interview, if you're relaxed and confident, how do you make yourself be relaxed and confident if you're not feeling that way? Um, so I call that in my academic work, I've talked about that as the paradox of Wu Wei, um, tension of essentially, how can you try not to try? And then that led to my first trade book, uh, which we're describing this concept called try not to try. So uh, this is the, the tension that these thinkers faced. And uh, they, they propose various ways around it. So I argue in the book, um, in, in trying not to try, and this is actually a new thing that's not in my previous academic work, just from a cognitive scientific perspective, it makes sense that it's paradoxical to try to try not to try. Because you're, when you're, if you tell yourself relax or you're tr trying to fall asleep, you have insomnia and you say, just fall asleep, you're activating the part of your brain that you're actually trying to shut down. Mm -hmm. So using your brain to shut your brain down is directly paradoxical. You're, you're doing the opposite of what you're trying to do. Uh, the, the Chinese thinkers come up with various ways to kind of trick you into not noticing that. Um, so they give you like rituals to do, or they tell you to sit like this, or do these breathing things, or they try to give you riddles that confuse your mind. And um, it's a bit like, you know, counting sheep is a kind of indirect way around that, right? When you're, you have insomnia, you give your mind something really boring to do, and then it forgets that, you know, it's trying to fall asleep, and it does fall asleep. Um, and all these techniques have their advantages and their drawbacks. Um, but what occurred to me at a certain point after I wrote that book, one of these early Taoist stories talks about a drunken person uh, who, who's riding in a cart and they fall off and they're not hurt because they didn't know they were riding in the cart and they don't notice that they've fallen out and so they're relaxed and they kind of roll with it. And this is used as an analogy of the Taoist sage. So, but just an analogy. So the, the sage is drunk on heaven on the spiritual power and you know unlike alcohol um but the what piqued my interest there was this idea of alcohol as a technology 
as a cultural innovation, a way to get you around the paradox of trying not to try. So using your brain to shut your brain down is paradoxical, but sitting here drinking a liquid that's going to do that job for me is not. And one of the main functions of alcohol is to down-regulate the prefrontal cortex, which is the part you want to shut down when you're trying to relax or be spontaneous. So, so that got me interested in how cultures may have, cultures that realized there was a benefit to both individual and social benefit to states where we're not exerting cognitive control and we're not in charge. Um, have figured out that there's this kind of chemical shortcut or a way around the paradox. So that was, that was the main connection with my earlier work. There's also the fact that I'm just interested, uh, one, of my, one of my previous big research projects um, that I worked on with colleagues in various fields was uh, evolution of religion. So we kind of take it for granted that everywhere we go, everywhere we look in history, people are religious. They're worshiping invisible beings and building huge monuments to them and, and doing all this kind of, if you think of it objectively, kind of crazy stuff. Um, and, and so religion, I call it in one of my publications, a mystery hiding in plain sight. Why are people religious? Because it seems like it's such a costly behavior that human beings who didn't weren't prone to believing in religious things would outcompete the humans who did. So cultures that instead of building pyramids or like the Chinese building these huge, you know, the ancient Chinese people know about the first emperor of Qin's terracotta army, right? They built this enormous fake army and, but with real weapons and real wealth and it took, you know, a huge amount of labor. And then they buried it in the ground. <laughs> it's just like, why didn't, you know, an alternative China that um, used that money and time to build a real army to conquer their neighbors do better than, than this one. Um, and yet all the cultures we know of go for monumental waste um, in religious areas and, and individuals all over the world throughout history are religious. So, um, my colleagues and I argue that once you see that this is a mystery, to explain it, you have to explain what sort of benefits have been paying for the cost. And there are various benefits to religious beliefs and practices in terms of you know, build bonding people together, group identity um, that are useful. And so in a way, turning toward alcohol is just me using the same evolutionary reasoning to look at a new problem. And, and like religion, a, a mystery that's hiding in plain sight, because again, everywhere you look throughout history, all around the world, people drink or use similar intoxicants. And yet it's really costly behavior. It's physiologically damaging. It um, can lead to all sorts of social harm, chaos. And yet we keep doing it. We have this, the taste for alcohol has been in our species for a really long time. That should be more, that should puzzle people more than it does. And so that's, that was the other kind of impetus of writing drunk was saying, hey, we should be, we should be puzzled by this taste for intoxication. Let's try to explain it from an evolutionary perspective. And I think it took me, um, so I purposely read this book twice to make sure that I kind of understood the second time around a little bit better, um, the, the logic, the conclusions uh, reached. And I did want to mention the story of the person falling off the cart and uh, being unharmed mm -hmm. is to me that immediately brought the allegory of uh, the drunk driver who is unharmed or minimally harmed in an accident uh, yeah. in modern culture because they your immediate reaction if you are sober to an oncoming crash is to tense up to brace yourself for impact um, which inevitably will lead to greater damage to the person yeah. But a drunk driver, on the other hand, uh, is not aw as aware and relaxes and therefore is more flexible as the forces around them kind of careen. So mm -hmm. it it uh, became one of the, I think it was towards the end of the book, it was towards the conclusion. And yet it was one of the things that even two to 3,000 years later still fit perfectly within our modern society as an example of what happens when intoxicated. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, you know, falling off a cart 
doesn't hurt anybody else. <laughs> you know, driving, yes. operating a motor vehicle does. So yeah, there's a lot of ways, you know, as you know, in the book, I argue there are a lot of ways in which alcohol has become more dangerous in the modern mm -hmm. world. And, right. you know, there's, I could talk about those if you want, but certainly one of them also is that we have access to heavy machinery, <laughs> which right. we didn't used to. So, right. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get to that a little bit later. And, uh, the, the other point that I wanted to bring up right away was that in between the first and second readings of the book, um, I read it first and then looked at the kind of critical reception, um, the academic reception as well to the book. And um, I must say it was surprising to see how near universally positive the reception seemed to be. Um, perhaps you have a different perspective, of course, but <laughs> um, at least from, yeah. from this side of the table, it seemed very uh, positive and really the only criticism if you can call it that was that of the five main chapters of the book only one is dedicated to uh what is called the dark what do you call the dark side of dionysus um but you and uh those critics also make the good point that there is so much literature out there about the negative impacts of alcohol that your point in writing this book is not to add to that literature there's plenty out there it's to add to the positive sides of alcohol, or, uh, at least through the evolutionary lens and the civilization lens, while not forgetting that there are those negative effects. So um, I was not one of those critics who felt that that was an issue. I think <laughs> it's pretty, pretty well detailed by other people. So yeah, uh, so it's yeah. Not there's quite two. Necessary. I mean, so you know, my response to that has been first of all just that the whole premise of the book is this stuff is so dangerous. Why didn't evolution get rid of our taste for it? Right. So the, the, right. the premise of the book is that it's a dangerous thing and it, um, you know, and I document all the ways in which cultures have tried to control it and try to use it safely. Um, but yeah, you're right. The, the, I don't, there's a massive literature on you know, the dangers of alcoholism and negative aspects of alcohol. And that's all valuable literature. It's just, that's not my purpose in the book. And, and my purpose in the book is to try to fill what I see as a hole in the literature on alcohol. So I, I do, I think one of the big problems is we, we still uh, look at alcohol solely through this medicalized lens. So we only talk about the physiological impact. We talk about it purely from a medical perspective. And that's just a, it's a unhelpfully narrow way of looking at alcohol. You have to also see these positive individual and social benefits. And then you may, at the end of the day, say, you know what? Still no. <laughs> you know, the costs are too high and we don't want it. I don't want it in my life or we don't want it in our organization. That's a perfectly rational decision. Um, but it has to be made with all of the relevant information at hand. And I, I think that up till now, we've been kind of flying blind on this topic. We just haven't anthropologically, scientifically, historically, it's been a huge blind spot. We haven't been able to see these functions, even though I think people, ordinary people kind of intuitively get it. They know that there's a reason to drink, um, but we're not, no one's, I don't think, anyone's really articulated those reasons well. And so that's one of the things I wanted to do in the book is just lay them out and show how, you know, historically, how you can see them being manifested in cultures throughout history. Sure. And uh, for those, I definitely, uh, if you're listening to this, I hope that by the end of it, you will have ordered a copy of the book, uh, the initial edition or the paperback edition. But I did want to kind of start off the dive into the book with uh, what I consider your thesis statement for the book. Okay. And this is that I'm going to quote the book and um, studies within it that you reference several times throughout the interview. I promise always with as much context as possible because nothing worse okay. than cherry picking. Yeah, yeah. All right. So quote, this book argues that far from being an evolutionary mistake, chemical intoxication helps solve a number of distinctly human challenges distinctively human challenges, excuse me, enhancing creativity, alleviating stress, building trust, and pulling off the miracle of getting fiercely tribal primates to cooperate with strangers. 
The desire to get drunk, along with the individual and social benefits provided by drunkenness, played a crucial role in sparking the rise of the first large-scale societies. We could not have civilization without intoxication. And to your point about the lack of, of positive literature or literature exploring or even considering the exploration of alcohol and intoxication as a boon to civilization um, has it's been really absent it's been completely absent mm. um, lest one be labeled uh you know an alcoholic in writing if you will yeah and was there as you were thinking about this and writing this book was there a particular change in the landscape as it were that said okay people might be ready to accept this viewpoint or at least listen to the points that i want to make in this book no <laughs> i just decided <laughs> to do it anyway <laughs> this is this is my problem is i just kind of stumble into yeah. topics that interest me and um i mean i you know as you said the the critical reception has been almost universally positive which surprised me um even from people in the medical community well maybe not so much people in the medical community um so that was surprising and i ex i did expect a lot more backlash from the public in terms of you know angry emails telling me um you know how can you defend alcohol you know i'm i'm a recovering alcoholic or i'm a child of an alcoholic and um you know alcohol again I'm very much aware of how much damage alcohol has caused to people, um, how dangerous it is. I have a history of alcoholism in my family. I've seen alcoholism. Um, so I, I know it. And um, these are, they're often very heartfelt messages. They're, they're typically not mean or they're angry. They're just kind of confused why I would want to defend alcohol or, um, but I got, I have gotten much many fewer of those emails than I expected. Um, I think most people realize that I realize that alcohol is dangerous and that it can cause a lot of harm. Um, and again, like I think the the kind of the most common positive feedback I've gotten from readers has been, I knew there was a reason I used the substance. Now I understand better what the reasons are. And that's going to allow me, and I understand in some ways more clearly what the dangers are, and that's going to allow me to use it in the future in a more kind of strategic, intelligent, and safe way. And to, I think in your defense as well, you, as though you have many, many interests across the board, um, you'd never claim to be, you know, a medical doctor on this. It's, it, yeah. that's not the point of, of what you're writing either. And in the acknowledgements, you specifically, one that kind of popped out to me was um, thanking a colleague who had helped you kind of understand the role of alcohol dehydrogenase, ADH, in yeah. processing uh, ethanol into acetaldehyde and into further compounds. And so to me, that read as, look, this isn't meant to be the medical guidebook on why yeah. you get drunk. It's to start the conversation and say, mm -hmm. hey, this is something we need to talk about. Um, and for me, that was uh, and this is the last thing before we get really into the meat of the book, which is I, I'm coming from a, I know this is a whiskey podcast, yeah, uh, right. about things, but I'm also coming from, you know, a, a biochemical background. Um, I'm a recovering medievalist. Okay. And um, so I had always uh, read works like this, read monographs as uh, through those lenses and read mm -hmm. those two points through those lenses. So for me, reading a book that was ostensibly written from more of a socio-historic uh, a socio -historic viewpoint with those other viewpoints interspersed took a little time for me to understand. It took a time to understand mm -hmm. um, the logic structures of a different field of study and how certain conclusions were, were come to in a way that I wouldn't have come to maybe in a biochemical field or, or even a strictly historical field so right um, but that's how, yeah and if i could interject there it would, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, beca do. that's because you know biochemists or doctors um 
they're looking at proximate mechanisms, right? They're interested in what is the metabolism of alcohol? What are the genetic markers of propensity toward alcoholism? Um, historians are interested in what alcohols were used by this culture, how were they produced, you know, um, how were they traded? Um, I feel like, you know, both, and all that information is really crucial, but no one's pulled out and said, well, let's look at ultimate. So that's all proximate causation. Hmm. Well, let's pull out and look at ultimate causation. So what are the evolutionary dynamics that would produce that mechanism, that physiological mechanism? And what are the evolutionary dynamics that would produce that desire to create that type of alcohol? Um, so I think that's the difference is that when you, you know, when you put on your evolutionary goggles, you, you get to be looking at things from a perspective where you can actually explain causes instead of just documenting uh, mechanisms. So that's what I find really helpful about taking the evolutionary point of view. Absolutely. And I think uh, it, it helps. It's not necessary to understand the book, but I think it does help to go into it with the understanding that that's the viewpoint taken. And that's the mindset of, of you as the author going into it. So kind of broadly speaking, um, I've broken this up into three sections and it's mostly aligns with what you've written in the book. It's just kind of jigsawing in a different way. Um, the first being the archeological record and creation slash discovery of alcohol. Mm -hmm. the second being the kind of psychochemical angle. Uh, they were talking about the down, down regulation of the prefrontal cortex and the positive and negative benefits they're in. And then finally, the alcohol in the modern age, which mm -hmm. I've also alluded to a little bit going forward. And if it sounds uh, to previous listeners, like I've done extensive research for this interview, this is probably the most that I've re researched for any interview done. So yeah, far. that's a lot um, of sticky notes in that book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure I got these things as down as I could before coming in here. So All right. let's start, let's start where it began. So th there are competing theories on the discovery slash creation of alcohol. Discovery being through nature, creation through human, through purposeful human activity. And the two main ones that you put forth are the kind of accidental consequence theory. There's fruit lying around, mm -hmm. it ferments, it creates low levels of alcohol, which then get us and other primates and other animals tipsy, a little bit drunk if we have too much of it. And then the other side being a more purposeful one of the beer before bread theories. So between those two, um, is it oversimplifying to say that those are really the two large camps that people kind of fall into when looking at the early history of alcohol? I think that's fair. So um, the standard story has always been in the same way that you know, we've been told our taste for alcohol is an evolutionary mistake. The story about the origin of alcohol has always been a mistake story. So, as you said, you know, either we discover rotten fruit lying around and, you know, it makes us feel good. So we discover fruit wine or, you know, we have agriculture already and we're making bread and we eat bread making out, you know, leave our sourdough starter out and it ferments and we taste that and it tastes good. It's always been a kind of happenstance. And crucially, the story was always this happened after we had agriculture. Maybe the fruit thing we could have discovered on our own, you know, as hunter gatherers, but certainly beer, the story was, was a post agriculture thing. And, and that's just, I didn't know any different when I started doing the research for the book, but when I started digging into the archeology, span you know, I ran into this movement that started in the fifties, this beer before bread movement that argued that that story doesn't make sense because if you look, so talking about the Fertile Crescent in beer, mm -hmm. if you look at the Fertile Crescent, you've got hunter gatherers coming together, creating this monumental religious architecture and having these huge, basically huge raves, you know, they're having this feast and they're dancing. We don't know exactly everything they're doing. We don't know what their belief system was, but they're drinking beer. Um, large quantities of beer, probably uh, laced with hallucinogens. And so in this region, the Fertile Crescent, we have direct evidence of beer making from 13,000 years ago. So that's way before agriculture. Um, and we, we've got indirect evidence of, of alcohol production and consumption going back 20,000 years. So, so thousands and thousands of years before agriculture. 
And so the beer before bread argument is that hunter gatherers, so the standard story is hunter gatherers settled down and started agriculture to make food, right? To make bread. These people are arguing, no, they settled down and started agriculture to make more and better beer. <laughs> they wanted, you know, to increase their beer production. And then maybe, you know, they figured out you could eat the stuff as bread as well. Um, and this is bolstered by a similar pattern across the world where, you know, and you look at South America, Australia, North America, the first cultivated crops seem to be chosen for their psychoactive properties, not for their nutrition benefits. So, I, you know, I talk in the book about uh, Teosinte in South America, right. which is the ancestor of modern maize, but it, if you were interested in food, you would never notice this plant because it sucks. It makes really bad grain, um, but it's got this um, sugary uh, stock that is great for turning into beer. And so it's pretty clear that whoever you know chose Teosinte and sort of cultivating it and turning it into modern maize was motivated by making chicha, this, this form of beer that's still made out of maize in South America. Um, so it's, it's, it's intoxication first and nutrition second. And, and this is the sense in which, you know, once I really got into this literature, I was like, oh, this really is great for my thesis, the book, because, you know, it's, a, this is a really literal sense in, in which intoxication gave rise to civilization. It was the desire to get intoxicated that, that, that motivated hunter gatherers to settle down and start start agriculture. Sure. And to, I do want to focus on uh, particularly go back to the Tepe because it is such a large part of the historical record um, that you're referencing. But um, just before we get to there, you already mentioned a couple of other intoxicants uh, as a side to alcohol, whether hallucinogens and other things that could get us high. Yeah. Uh, so throughout the book, you know, alcohol is called wow. the king of intoxicants among other uh, platitudes, maybe the wrong word, but we'll go with it. Um, and it's something that clearly given its cost, evolution should, should have selected out long ago. And yet, were there any intoxicants that at that same time, assuming the beer before bread theory is, uh, let's say accurate, mm -hmm. and that we achieved beer before bread, were there any other intoxicants available at the time that were really serious candidates for achieving the same results as alcohol? I don't think so. So there are, there are other intoxicants that overlap a lot with alcohol and, and their functions. So cannabis is one of them. Kava, which is this intoxicant consumed in the Pacific, is similar um, in, in certain ways, uh, you know, down-regulating the prefrontal cortex, stimulating some positive hormones, endorphin, serotonin. Um, but these other, so what makes alcohol, so I, I feel like if you gave a group of cultural engineers a job and you were like, we need something that here's the design specs, you know, it has to be really easy to make and discover. You, you have to be able to make it out of anything in any climate, anywhere. Uh, it has to be easily dosable. It has to have consistent effects across individuals. It should be pleasant to consume. Um, this is alcohol. And, and so, you know, if you look at, for instance, cannabis, cannabis has some advantages. So cannabis is ancient as well in, in human culture. We've been um, cultivating cannabis for a really, really long time, thousands, thousands of years. Um, but it's got some drawbacks as a drug. So um, it, the positive things are that it's not as physiologically harmful as alcohol. Mm -hmm. And it's also not physically addictive. So it's got, those are two really big pluses in, in its favor. Um, the problems are that it's, the main one I think is that it's effects, cognitive effects really vary from individual to individual. Um, so I think I talked in the book about the fact that I've got, you know, I have friends who smoke cannabis and want to talk about philosophy or go dancing or, um, and consistently my entire life, um, I smoke cannabis, I get super paranoid and then I fall asleep. And that's, 
not really useful socially. Um, and, you know, now that cannabis is legal and then we've got all these different strains, everyone's like, oh, you just haven't tried the right kind of sativa. Try it. And it's just bullshit. Like every, every strain of cannabis has exactly the same effect on me. Um, and so that's not, so that's wouldn't be useful as a social drug if it's making me really sleepy and paranoid while it's making my friend, you know, talkative and energetic. Um, so it, it var- the effects vary too much individual to individual. And the other problem with cannabis is it's really hard to dose. So it's always historically typically been smoked. Um, and if you don't know how to smoke it, if you don't know how to hold it in your lungs, um, you, you don't get the dose, you don't get the effect. Um, and smoking is kind of a pain in the ass, frankly. It's just, you know, it's not as easy as drinking a liquid. Um, so it's just difficult to do del- cannabis. The active ingredient in cannabis is difficult to deliver and difficult to dose in a way that alcohol is not. Um, if you're living in a traditional culture where you make chicha or you make a local beer, um, you know exactly what two glasses of that are going to do to you. And no one has to teach you how to drink and swallow. You can, you know, that's a pretty right. natural thing for people to do. So I think those are the there's advantages. And then psychedelics um, are just too powerful. They just they divorce you from reality in such an extreme way that uh, they're not useful socially. So I think I think alcohol, if there's some way you could get alcohol, if alcohol would just be less physiologically harmful and addictive. That would be the best, but we don't we don't have a drug that combines all those benefits um, without those drawbacks yet. Uh, you know, nothing's perfect yet, but um, yeah. But you're right, though. There, there is a certain element, and I'm particularly interested in the dosing aspect of it. Where, at the end of the day, it's an ethanol molecule that you are imbibing. You know, we know today that a certain amount of beer is equivalent to a certain amount of wine, equivalent to a certain amount of distilled liquor, at 40 proof and then gets more complicated from there. But the basic idea is still the same that one beer won't have the same effect as one glass of wine, won't have the same effect as one shot, but ultimately you can make the equivalencies on paper and be pretty close to the in practice effects Mm -hmm. that you're going to see. Um, I did like also the comparison of psychedelics just being too strong. I think in the book you referred to them as um, the difference between mind altering and mind rending. Yeah, so yeah, it just divorces yeah. you from reality completely. It divorces you from reality so much that, and for such a long period. The other thing is the the yeah. um, latency the half- period. So, mm-hmm. yeah, half life. So psychedelics take you out of commission for like six, eight hours. Um, mm-hmm. The other huge advantage of alcohol is that because you know we're descended from fruit eating primates who have developed this physiological mechanism to get it out of our bodies. Um, we, we clear it from our systems really quickly. So it, it's got a very short half-life in that regard. Absolutely. Um, I myself have a pretty high tolerance, so um, <laughs> thank, thankfully, and I'm interested in looking at studying ADH and ADH4 and ADH12 levels to see what's, what's really going on there. Yeah, no, I'm, one thing I don't talk about in the book, and I I, don't, I talk about alcohol intolerance. So, you know, this, this um, mutation, set of mutations that causes the so-called Asian flushing syndrome. Mm-hmm. And that's a crucial part of my argument that this has been around for a long time, but it hasn't spread. Um, but what I don't know much about and what would be interesting is if there are, and I've been asked this in podcasts and you know, got to book talks and stuff, um, if different populations if we know much about the physiology of what, and whether it's the case that different populations have different levels of tolerance for alcohol, um, or even within a population, how individuals vary in that regard. Yeah. And that, that's an interesting topic. I don't know much about that. I, I can tell you in doing just a cursory look at some research, there uh, hasn't been much research into that for the same reasons okay. as there hasn't been much research before, before you look into the positive aspects. But um, I'm curious just for myself, because I should not have a high tolerance, genetically speaking, or, or nothing in, in my family's history points to anything like that. No one was mm-hmm. ever a heavy drinker. There's really no history of alcoholism uh, there, even though we're, we are from what, uh, you know, we're from Poland, Ukraine, Russia area. So Northern drinking culture. Yeah. And yet 
uh very few people in my family drank drink now i mean people look at me and think how the hell did you get into whiskey and yeah. it's a fair question because i don't know uh so it, is it it's, what's um, what's your ethnic background so almost Ukrainian. almost 100 almost 100 percent ashkenazi jew yeah because that's so ashkenazi jews are another one of these subpopulations that have some version of that asian flushing gene syndrome in mm -hmm. in their population so th there's two instances uh, in europe where it arose and that's one of them um, so it's interesting that, you know, who knows what the mechanisms are that preserve that, um, set of mutations in that population. Yeah. And as I, I did note that, uh, it was one of the few populations that had that flushing syndrome. And again, I am, I've put this out there before it's 99.6% Ashkenazi and 0.4 other Eastern Europeans. So we're not going yeah, that far right. afield. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, so I'm curious cause it doesn't really makes sense i would be an evolutionary out or a genetic outlier in that but yeah anyway uh going back to the archaeological record um something that really occurred to me in looking at as you said direct evidence of beer production uh and indirect evidence going back twenty thousand years direct evidence 11 to twelve thousand years um one of the things i wanted to ask about was when you're looking at the archaeological record let's say you're at gobekli tepe in turkey and modern day turkey and looking at a basin that had some uh, remnant that led you to believe there were grains there that were fermented and consumed. Um, since bread itself, a yeasted bread, is by nature very mildly alcoholic, mm. um, how does one tell the difference in the archaeological record between the uh, between evidence of beer and evidence of bread consumption? Um, so one thing is you can, uh, there's clear differences in, in basins and, uh, tool sets between liquids and non-liquids. And so, you know, these basins at Quebec like Tepe clearly were designed to hold a liquid, large quantities of a liquid, which wouldn't be the case if you were making bread. Um, at this site, the, I don't know if I talked about it in the book because I'm not sure it was discovered yet, but the, the, it's been pushed back to 13,000 years ago, direct evidence of beer making mm -hmm. in modern day Israel. Um, and it's uh, the, the evidence for that is I think, you know, basins that are consistent and, uh, uh, you know, jugs and things like that, that are consistent with, with beverages, with liquids. Um, but there are certain chemical signatures of the malting process that are distinctive for making beer that I think were what made this research group conclude that this was clearly a beer making operation and not a bread making one. Um, so there's distinctive chemical signatures of um, and making beer is more complicated than one would think. Because you can't just, it's not like you throw a bunch of grain and water together and it turns into beer. You kind of malt it and there's all this stuff in between. Um, all of those steps leave distinctive chemical signatures. And so that's what they're picking up. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. And in the archaeological record as well, as I noted, the bread before beer, beer, sorry, beer before bread um, theories go back to now the 1950s. So they've been around for a couple of generations of evolutionary sciences and, and studies. Um, are, there, are there other theories that are being tested that come from that? And kind of simultaneously, are there, you know, how do you test that beer before bread theory to its most absolute conclusion? Well, you have to show that consistently it's the case. You have to be able to identify what are the species that are domesticated first. And you have to be able to figure out with some degree of competence what, what those species were for. Um, and, you know, in the case of, so I talk about Australia with the, the first cultivated, um, there, there wasn't large scale agriculture, but there was agric some agriculture in Australia. Um, and it was focused on the ingredients of, of pituri, this, this kind of chew that's, that has features that are a bit like tobacco, but also narcotic and a little bit hallucinogen. Um, and there's just no, when you see, there's no nutrition 
value to this thing. It's only psychoactive. Um, same thing in North America, the, the first cultivated crop is tobacco. And tobacco also is not going to make, you know, it's not going to feed you. It's going right. to affect your head. Um, and tobacco, again, combined with hallucinogens, they were, they were combining up with hallucinogenic herbs. Um, so it's, you need to kind of gather together a kind of knockout collection of data like that. And I think, I don't know, you know, I'm not an archaeologist and I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day battles on this. Um, I know that there are people who push back against the beer before bread and said, look, you know, um, here's some really early evidence of bread, you know, um, maybe before agriculture. Um, here's, you know, there's, they're not mutually exclusive. They were probably always pursued in tandem. Um, so it's not, you know, I don't think it's the case that 100% of the archaeological communities behind this view it, but it's certainly grown. Um, and I think it's, I find it really compelling. As do I. I found myself more and more attuned to that viewpoint as I as I read through the book, which uh, no doubt is partly because, of course, it forms the basis of the argument. Yeah, but it's, it's helpful. It's helpful. Uh, yeah. It's helpful to understand yeah. the argument for sure. Um. So we think about the type. There was uh, one question that uh, really kind of dug at me. So I want to just talk about the cultural group selection, mm -hmm. uh, and um, start off with another quote from the book. So this goes to the beer before bread theory as well. So proponents of the beer before bread hypothesis rightly emphasize how the increased cohesiveness and scale of intoxicant using cultures would give them a distinct advantage in competition with other groups, allowing them to cooperate more effectively in work, food production, and warfare. Uh, so as you were saying before, the site at Quebec de Tepe, um, and I apologize if I keep mixing my pronunciation on that. But... I have trouble pronouncing it. Yeah. Okay. I do the same enough. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. As you noted, though, uh, it's a site where it's clear that cultures came together, groups of people, let's say, not cultures, mm -hmm. but let's say groups of people for simplicity, came together, um, got intoxicated, shared feasting, drinking, becoming intoxicated uh, long before what we think agriculture began, in-place agriculture. Uh, to me, what was uh, missing, and I'm hoping you can elucidate a little bit, is that Within the context of alcohol and intoxicants, creating those shared experiences, getting people to trust each other and to uh, cooperate, what was the incentive for groups to come together in the first place in that place to, um, you know, like the, there is the eventuality they became trusting of each other, but what brought them to the place in the first place? Because they must have had some sense of trust just inherently in order to put themselves in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, Cause there's beer, <laughs> there's, you know, there's a party, uh, people are drawn to, so, you know, I talk about the fact that whoever, whatever subgroup kind of got figured out how to make beer and got control of the resources to make it um, probably accrued some amount of power. Right. And they were like the, you know, frat who manages to get a keg and you know gains prestige because they can host a party um these people could host a party because they had alcohol and you know again approximately alcohol why do we drink it because it makes us feel good um, that is the proximate psychological cause and so you know alcohol was basically this kind of um you know, it's like luring, it's like moths to a flame. You know, you have the substance that makes you feel good. People want it. They want to come and participate. Um, there were probably then, you know, uh, tasks imposed upon you. Clearly, the people who cut and drag these stones, you know, were not doing it for fun. They were doing it because they were going to be rewarded probably with a feast and some beer. Um, so, so there are people are, they're lured in by this intoxicant um, because it's, it is triggering reward networks in our brain. In order to get continued access to that intoxicant, there's probably things they have to do together in cooperation to build the site, to engage in these rituals. And this is where, you know, um, alcohol is working in tandem with other cultural innovations. And one of those, and the one I studied previous to this is religion. So the way that 
rituals and costly displays and um, you know doing pointless things together actually binds us together as a group. Uh, my colleague Demetrius Cycladis has a new book out on ritual. It's just called Ritual. Um, but you know, his point is humans engage in these useless behaviors, apparently useless behaviors, like cutting these stones and dragging them however far they drag them right. and putting them up vertically and carving these animals in them or carving the other way around. But yeah, you know, there's a huge amount of effort for what? For just this big stupid stone. Um, it does, it seems like an immense waste of time. And yet clearly the culture that um, did this was successful. It was successful in kind of unifying uh, clans, different groups from across a wide geographic region. So, so rituals going on, um, belief, probably belief in supernatural beings is, a, is playing a role here. And so it's synergistically, all this stuff is working together. And that's why, you know, typically religion and intoxicants go together. I mean, they see this all, all over the world where, um, they have similar functions and similar benefits, and they often work better when combined. And I'm going to throw in a quote here that's uh, a little outside of the a little outside of the outline, but I think it was worthwhile. Um, that came up in your uh, one of your C-SPAN interview uh, last year, which was that not only does alcohol fit with religion, but also prohibition also tends to only stick around when it is paired with religion as well. Yeah. Um, and I mean, to that end, though, so I guess my second question then is a clarification just that. So people come together because there's beer, and then the uh, consequent result is that they have gotten drunk together, they've gotten high together, they feasted together, they trust each other, and therefore are more mm -hmm. cooperative going forward. Um, what I am also assuming then in that. Uh, theory is that though the group that let's say held the beer the group yeah. that had held the knowledge and power to create the beer then must have also considered that it was more beneficial for them to bring in these other groups and try to cooperate with them rather than keeping the knowledge of beer uh, exclusive to themselves and for their own benefit Mm -hmm. That's because you, groups groups are always competing, um, so you don't have the luxury. It's not like, let's say, our group discovers how to make beer, and we're having fun. We have beer all to ourselves. Um, that's not going to last very long. <laughs> you know, some other group's going to come and try to take our stuff. Um, I mean, you see hunter gatherer groups um, competing in this way all the time, and so I think you know. What we see in a site like Gobekli Tepe is the beginnings of a scaling up of, of society that is probably done in self-defense. Um, you know, you, if you can scale up, you can defend yourself better against other groups. Um, so I think it's done just to protect um, this knowledge and this power. And by, and by co-opting other groups then and bringing them into your group, you're better able to do that. So I don't think it's a, there's a contradiction between kind of sharing the knowledge and, and discovering it. In order to hang on to that discovery, you've got to expand. Gotcha. And I do want to, I want to add one more example in here that um, has always been very, uh, let's say very um, important to me. I love ancient Egypt. I love ancient cultures mm -hmm. in general, but particularly ancient Egypt. And of course, for many, many decades, and not hundreds of years, the prevailing theory about the creation of the pyramids and the building of the pyramids was that it was done by slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, until, and I'm actually trying to, to find the name of the site because I know I should know it off the top of my head, but I don't. But there's a, a burial site next to the Great Pyramids and next to the pyramid complex that clearly shows that the people building these pyramids were rewarded with uh, with beer, with bread, um, they were fed well, they were paid well, um, they were considered honored. Uh, they were honored themselves to work on the pyramids. They were also honored by society in, mm -hmm. in building these monumental structures. And 
I think those, even though it's several thousand years later, it still goes to the same point that beer and the creation of these monumental art architectures go together. And mm -hmm. it makes a lot more sense to go with the, they were rewarded for this work and saw mm -hmm. beer and bread as the reward rather than they were forced to do it because it, it, it could be a plausible explanation, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I point out that you see this in all kind of pre-modern societies. The only way you can get monumental architecture built, the only way you can get um, certain types of public goods built, like canals and things that you need lots of people to build and that don't benefit any one person, but benefit everyone, is is to use alcohol i mean to have basically to feast the workers to you know lure them in with a feast and reward them with a feast um and it's still the case in non-market economies today that this is how you get you know you need a new church built or you need a new school built that's how you do it um so the you know the end of you know true wage labor where you know, we need a school built, so we just hire a contracting firm and they hire some people to come do it. That's a very modern new thing. Um, in any kind of non-market economy, typically it's um, through use of food as well. You know, and ideally, you know, luxury food, meats, things that maybe people can't get easily on their own. Um, but alcohol, um, that's how you get people together to, to build things. And hope that in the process there aren't too many fingers lost or crushed or uh, yeah, other than that. But um, but they're drinking. Yeah. You know, it's also crucial to keep in mind that like at the time of the pyramids, the stuff they're drinking is like two to three percent ABV. Right. And for for most of our evolutionary history, that's what we've been drinking is typically beers, you know, grain based alcohols, and typically clocking in at about two or three percent ABV. Um, and if you're working hard and you're eating and you can drink 2% beer all day and not really get drunk. So, um, so there is also, we don't want to kind of imagine they're drinking triple IPAs, right? right. <laughs> they're drinking, they're drinking really weak, um, more like session ales. Absolutely. All right. And, um, with that, I do want to move on to the, uh, second angle to take with the book, which is the psychochemical angle. Yeah. Um, my own word, not the one that, not one that you use in the book. So if it's incorrect uh, and you're listening, throw that my way. Um, so the primary effect of alcohol, as we mentioned before, is that it does, is the down regulation of the PFC. And maybe I have that causation wrong. It's, or that maybe it's more that our purpose in drinking it is the down, is to downregulate that PFC and feel what you call the extended childhood. Yeah, so the it is so alcohol is a stimulant and a depressant at the same time. So it's very complicated. And I, I quote the journalist Stephen Brown who calls it a pharmacological hand grenade um, yep. because you've got drugs like LSD or cocaine that are going in and very doing a very specific thing. Um, alcohol is like a kid hitting all the keys on the keyboard at the same time. Like it's doing all these different things at once. Um, and sometimes in diff at different points in the, the onset of, of drunkenness, you know, intoxication. So one function is this depressant function and it is, it is centered on the PFC. So it's directly suppressing the activity of the PFC. And that's where a lot of the benefits come from. So you know, kind of regaining as a, say in the book, this um, it temp one way to look at it is it's temporarily reversing the, the maturation process in humans. So we you know, very slowly mature. The PFC is the last part of the brain to mature. And I guess it's probably, it's got to be the last part of the human to mature because um, everything else, you know, you're physiologically otherwise mature. Um, your, your PFC doesn't mature until you're in your 20s. 23, 24. Um, and so, you know, that's weird. There's something funny about it. And, and I argue in the book that part, part of what's going on here is this uh, design trade off that evolution's got to make. So it wants us to have a PFC because we have to be able to get up in the morning and tie our shoes and get to school on time. Um, but it also wants us to be able to be 
creative and flexible and open to new stuff and to learn easily and to trust easily. And those are intention because the PFC interferes with those things. And the solution basically is to just slow walk the development of the PFC to wait until you're in your twenties before it's fully online. Um, and then, you know, I argue alcohol is a cultural technology for temporarily reversing that to getting back to being like a seven year old in terms of your cognitive flexibility and your trustingness. Um, so that's one function. The other main thing it's doing is boosting social pro-social hormones. So serotonin, endorphins, um, things that, that directly create feelings of trust and liking and affection in, in other people and, and make us feel good about ourselves as well. I mean, that's the, that's the feel good part of alcohol. It's, um, it's boosting these feel good hormones. And so those are the, in terms of the functions of alcohol, those are the two main effects. The Whiskey Ring Podcast is proudly sponsored by Impex Beverages. Impex imports premium and rare whiskey, gin, rum, mezcals, liqueurs, and cordials from all over the world, from Scotland to Japan to Israel, Belgium, and Wales. Whether it's Kilhoman, Pandaren, Port Escague, Glenallachie, Ohishi, Fukano, M&H, Ardnamurkin, Black Tot, and more, there's guaranteed to be something in the Impex portfolio you'll love. Impex also oversees some of the most prestigious independent bottlers in the game, including Single Malts of Scotland, Single Cast Nation, Adelphi Selection, and its own Impex collection. Take a look at their site, impexbev.com, or reach out if you're curious about their offerings. I'm proud to have many of their bottles on my shelves and love sharing them with friends whenever I can. Thank you to Sam and to the team for joining the Whiskering Podcast as guest and sponsor. And now a word from our newest sponsor. The most exclusive whiskey in the world can't be bought in a store. Born in Edinburgh, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society is the world's largest whiskey club with over 30,000 members worldwide. They bottle each cask of whiskey as is. No diluting, no artificial coloring, or chill filtration. With new whiskeys released every week, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society offers the opportunity to taste spirits straight from the cask. I've been a member for over two years now, and I've loved the chance to explore my favorite distilleries with truly unique offerings, in particular from distilleries 4 and 53, and discovering new single malts not available anywhere else. Not a Scotch fan? No problem. The Scotch Malt Whiskey Society releases 20 plus bottles each month to its members, including, yes, Scotch, but also including gin, bourbon, rum, and more. In fact, my favorite recent bottling was a corn whiskey from the largest family-owned distillery in the U.S., aged 11 years in New Oak and bottled at cast strength. This is a bottling that people have clamored for for years, and it was only available to Scotch Malt Whiskey Society members. If you're interested in joining, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society has graciously offered a discount to listeners of this podcast. Use code WRP, short for Whiskey Ring Podcast, at checkout for 20% off an annual membership at smwsa.com. That stands for Scotch Malt Whiskey Society of America. I will also be putting the link and code in my bio and show notes for this and upcoming episodes. Thank you to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society for joining the Whiskey Ring Podcast as our newest sponsor, and please visit smwsa.com with code WRP for 20% off your annual membership. And following that, I wanted to uh, pick out one particular study. And again, there are multiple ones throughout the book that are uh, worth going into further, but this one, again, stuck out to me was the contagion of smiling study. Yeah. So um, in short, in the study, the you have three groups, the group getting the alcohol, a placebo group, and a control group and the um uh the group given alcohol um, had a higher rate of smile contagion of um, duchenne smiles mm -hmm. that are uh, authentic and not uh, i think as you put it smile for the camera yeah, uh, yeah smiles as well so these are ones that are not only contagious among the group participants but were also 
um, reciprocated and kind of kept going along the line. Whereas in the both the placebo and the control groups, that didn't happen. And what you, the conclusion that you come to in the way you word it is that it's important to note that the ethanol itself, not just the setting or cultural expectations, is doing the work mm -hmm. in that example. Yeah. Um, so and you know that because actually the design is slightly different in that there's there's actually four conditions. So in all the kind of gold standard um, modern studies of alcohol, um, you've got uh, you you have two groups getting alcohol. One of them is being told they're getting alcohol, and one of them is being told they're not. They're getting a non-alcoholic drink, and then you get two groups who are not getting alcohol, and one of them is being told they're not getting alcohol. And the other one's being falsely told that they are. So it's this double blind placebo uh, where you've got, and the nice thing that allows you to really separate the physiological effect from the placebo effect. Um, so if the people who are told that they're not getting alcohol, but they really are, have this effect, it really seems like it's chemical, especially if it's not um, the people who are told they're getting alcohol, but didn't get alcohol, don't show it. So it's a way to really tease apart the, the differing um, impacts of both cultural expectations about alcohol and just what ethanol is physiologically doing to people. Uh, to me, that's why it was so fascinating is there are certain contagious human uh, activities and, and human actions that we think of, like someone sneezes and someone else sneezes, yeah. someone smiles, someone yeah. smiles, um, someone yawns and someone else yawns. But being able to, as you say, tease out between what is uh, s socially driven versus what's truly driven by the ethanol molecule, the function mm -hmm. of the ethanol molecule and the agency of that molecule uh, was was fascinating. And I apologize, I missed that fourth, that fourth group that was for the separation yeah. of the alcohol group into the being told and being told you weren't. Yeah, it's crucial because you have to have people who think they're getting. And, and one of the reasons that it's only been relatively recently that we've had um, these kind of really good controlled studies is because it's actually hard to do because it's alcohol is pretty distinctive tasting. Um, right. So it takes, it takes some, some thinking and some, uh, some real work to make, to make an effective placebo. So to make a drink that tastes like an alcoholic drink, even though it's not, mm -hmm. is hard. Um, so it's been just, it's just methodologically difficult. Um, so that's one of the reasons it hasn't been done until recently, but it's been useful because until these kind of studies, um, there were always people who were able to say, well, it's just placebo effect or it's just, you know, cultural expectations, but this is really able to show that it's not. And in that particular study, um, I don't remember, or I'd rather, I didn't write this down, but were the study participants who were given alcohol or and those who were told they were given alcohol given um you know beer versus uh versus wine versus some kind of a cocktail it was a cocktail um, this is this is almost impossible to do with beer. although actually with with um new like non-alcoholic beers are getting better and better i bet this is getting easier to do now because you actually have i think you're starting to get non-alcoholic beers that actually taste that it's hard to tell that it's not an alcoholic. Um, mm -hmm. But the, all these, this is Michael Syed's lab, um, and he's really been one of the leaders in this, this area. Um, and I think he pretty consistently, most, most alcohol studies pretty consistently use um, distilled liquor just because it's really easy to dose. And if you're using like a vodka, basically, you need something that's easy to, to disguise the taste of. Right, and vodka so, not tasting like anything. Yeah, works yeah, not tasting like it works perfectly. So there, most yeah. of these studies are using vodka in a cocktail, and the nice thing then is you can play around with a lot of components to make it look the same. You want it to be the same color. You want it to taste the same. Um, and it's really hard to do that unless you're using making some kind of cocktail with with a with a neutral spirit. And that does bring up a good point. I mean, uh, alcohol-free beers. Um, not familiar with wines, but alcohol-free beers and alcohol-free spirits, if they can be called that, have come quite a long way. I mean, I grew up with a grandfather who had type 2 diabetes, so couldn't really drink alcohol, but mm -hmm. had always had a pack of O'Doul's in the fridge because it was oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, an alcohol-free beer that he could enjoy. And 
it does while it not have doesn't have the same effect obviously it does have enough of a taste to it that perhaps you could mask it and um to your point i think they've only gotten better since mm-hmm. then um but you're right that is a, a limiting factor in terms of what you could really do yes yeah. yeah you can't have people knowing what group they're in yeah um so with the the psychochemical effects of it, I uh, mentioned this earlier, the ADH, the alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes that help break down alcohol in the body, they transfer to acetaldehyde and then to, uh, which is very toxic, and then to less toxic compounds that can then be broken down. Uh, you, write, you wrote in the book that some primates, including humans, you know, we possess this superpowered variant of, mm-hmm. that, uh, of that enzyme and the gene that causes that enzyme. Um, is the basically the question I was thinking of is could we have evolved to uh, use alcohol in the same way that we do Uh, let's say pre-modern because the distillation is a different thing but appreciating alcohol at two to three percent beers as we've talked about could we have evolved to use it without that superpowered ADH Enzyme no, gene. no, that was crucial. So in a way, <clears throat> I think the way to look at it is we're kind of pre-adapted to it. Mm-hmm. So in our primate ancestors, it was just an adaptation to being able to eat fruit because um, any fruit that's fallen on the ground, because fruit very quickly starts to develop some amount of ethanol. Um, mm-hmm. And so, and lots of other fruit eating, lots of fruit eating species have some form of AD, this ADH. Uh, AHDH, right? Um, so they, um, it's a pre-adaptation to eating fruit. And so this is what <clears throat> made humans then gave, put humans in a position to start using alcohol as a tool. Because if we didn't have that pre-adaptation to getting rid of it from our systems, uh, it would be really toxic. Right. And I think about all the uh, cows that get you know, spent grain from uh, distilleries. That's, yeah, it's still got a little bit of alcohol in it, and everyone jokes that the farmers say they have really happy cows in Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, there, but there is a point at which you can't. A cow cannot process the same levels of um, alcohol as a human or primate ancestor because they. I'm assuming I haven't checked on the cow specifically. I'm just using that as an example, but yeah, they don't have the same. No, I, I seriously doubt. I seriously doubt they have it at all because they're not. Right. They don't eat fruit. So yeah, true that that as well. Um, so I did have a question on the tolerance level, but I'm going to skip that because, as you said, that's there's more research to be done on that. And yeah. um, but I am quite fascinated to see where that research kind of leads. Mm-hmm. All right, so. Sounds like we're um, moving ahead. We have about 20 minutes left or so. I want to keep that tight timeline for you. Okay. So moving into the third section of, uh, of the book for me, which was alcohol in the modern age. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, I'm defining the modern age as really the last five to 700 years. This is when we see distillation um, and higher strength alcohols uh, becoming not only possible, but more widespread and uh, alongside that the isolation aspects we should mm-hmm. talk about a little bit so the as i said before in this interview you know for most of human history we're dealing with beers at two to three percent natural wine maybe getting to eight to ten percent at most yeah probably uh, not probably, probably lower not than that. Probably, yeah, right, until, probably until we started that. until we started breeding yeast that were super tolerant Right. natural yeast probably can't get you that high so right so we're, we're talking very low so that you would have to drink such voluminous quantities of to get what we think of as uh you know sloshed really really yeah, yeah, blackout yeah. drunk um you'd probably process it from your system before you could really get to that level now with distilled spirits and again this is coming from a guy running a whiskey podcast and tasting website yeah. um distilled spirits are very different because you can drink a very small quantity of vodka, whiskey, rum, and get the same effect as a case worth of beer or a full yeah. bottle of wine in one drink of distilled spirits. So on an evolutionary scale, 
like taking the really 30,000 foot view of evolutionary scale, the we're, we are not quite adapted. I think is how I'm reading it. You're, we're not quite adapted to distilled spirits. We're adapted to alcohol at the natural levels and perhaps a little bit above. But when we're talking 40% alcohol or even higher, that's not something that evolutionarily we're designed for. Quite yeah. That's where a lot of those really negative, um, one of the areas where the negative consequences really start to show themselves in modern society. Yeah. So the, yeah, the twin, I talk about the twin banes of the modern world when it comes to alcohol. Right. Um, and one of them is distillation. So, um, you know, if you think about the limits of natural fermentation, so yeast are in the, in the mix of all the stuff that's in there, they're turning jitters and starches into alcohol. At a certain point, the alcohol shuts them down. So they're, they're producing alcohol to kill the bacteria because they're competing with the bacteria for the calories. Mm -hmm they're more resistant to alcohol than the bacteria are. And so it's, it's basically kind of biological warfare between yeast and bacteria that gives us <laughs> ethanol. Um, but they're not infinitely resistant to it. So at a certain point, they shut themselves down. So that's why natural fermentation has limits. Um, humans for a really long time have been pushing those limits. So we've been breeding yeast that are hardier and hardier. Um, uh, actually, a colleague at, at Dartmouth has, has um, called yeast the, old, the oldest domesticated animal because we've been there's there's evidence of human selection of yeast going way way back. Um, so we're trying to get the yeast to be tougher and you know make stronger and stronger beers and wines. Um, but even with all this pushing for whatever twenty thousand years, maybe we've been doing it. Um, you, the best you can get is still like 16, 17 percent these you know, crazy Australian reds that, that come in around there. Um, distillation allows you, but this is, and this is a safety feature, right? Um, distillation allows you to circumvent that safety feature. So you pull off the alcohol um, and concentrate it and you can get, you know, vodkas can come in at like 90 something percent ABV. And there's two important things to know about that. One is that, um, this is really recent. So, you know, in Europe, we didn't have it distilled liquors available to your average person until 1600s, 1700s. And, you know, people are like, oh, that's hundreds of years. But I'm telling a story that starts 10 million years ago with this primate ancestor that first started eating fruit and, you know, really gets going 20,000 years ago, probably earlier than that. Um, so, a couple hundred years is in. And the scale of the story that I'm telling is yesterday. It really is not very long. Certainly not enough time for evolution to be doing anything about it. Um, so it's a new phenomenon. And as you said, it's really dangerous because even though it's still just ethanol, it's in such an incredibly strong concentration that I really think it should be considered a different drug because it's so much more powerful. The dosage is so different. Um, so yeah, if you're a you know fully grown adult and you're working and sweating and you're eating some food, you have an empty stomach, you can drink two percent, three percent beer all day and never get dangerously drunk. Um, it just physiologically it's impossible. You have to take in so much volume of liquid that you couldn't do it. Right. Um, but you get a bottle of vodka and you could you could kill yourself you know in an hour yeah. so it just we're just not it's such it's in such a we're not physiologically adapted to process so you know as you said we're kind of we're built to deal with alcohol but not when it's coming in at the rate that it's coming into our system when we're drinking a distilled spirit so um it's really a game changer it makes alcohol a lot more dangerous because that's when you can start getting you know it's when you can kill yourself you get so drunk you suppress your breathing um you can get you can go blind you can get and you can quickly you know i argue in the book that most of the benefits individual and social benefits of alcohol come at about 0.08 bac so about when you should stop operating heavy machinery um you know maybe two beers in for most people. Um, with distilled liquors, you can blow past 0.08 
in like two minutes, two minutes, like you could go right. really fast. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so it's just, um, it's just a lot more dangerous. And so I've been, I mean, one change in my life has been, I'm a whiskey fan. I love, I love scotch. Um, I love, I love a good cocktail. I love a Negroni. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've gotten more cautious about distilled liquors. Um, I'm more worried about them than I used to be. Um, and I've actually, I've never been, a, I've always been a wine and spirit fan. Um, I never have been that into beer, but I've started drinking beer now just because it is, it's arguably the safest delivery system for ethanol in the sense that it's, the weakest, right? And, it's, and it, right. it most closely approximates the stuff that most humans for most of history have been drinking. Um, and so, you know, the beer industry is a big fan of my book because I'm like, you know, beer is good. <laughs> and it is, it is one of the conclusions of my book. Um, so, so that's one takeaway is that you got to be really cautious about distilled liquors. Um, and the other is, you know, this problem of isolation. So distillation and isolation are the two problems. Um, historically, it, having private access to alcohol is almost unheard of. Um, the only way you could get your hands on alcohol is in public. Um, even in cultures where people brew at home, they make the alcohol in their private homes, there's often taboos against drinking your own alcohol. So you don't, you produce it, but you, to drink it, you have to go to your neighbors. And they're, you know, it's religious taboos against it. Um, and most cultures also have these really elaborate rituals that help to um, control alcohol consumption. So I talk about the Symposiarch in ancient Greece, right? Um, the Symposium wine party, the Symposiarchs in charge of deciding when to pass the wine around and deciding how strong to make it so the Greeks would water down their wine. Um, and that's a way of socially controlling inebriation levels. Um, I talk about Chinese banquets from ancient times until now. Um, you don't, at a Chinese banquet, you don't just get to keep drinking as much as you want. You, your cup's there on the table and you can't drink until someone makes a toast. And, and at least traditionally, um, who got to make a toast was ritually pretty strictly controlled. And so there you have this kind of ritual control of consumption. And even in really what seem like completely informal situations, like going to the pub with friends or something, you don't realize it, but you're regulating each other's drinking. And so, I mean, one obvious way is you typically order in rounds, right? Mm -hmm. So if you and I went to the pub and I downed my beer really quick, I can't just order another one. I have to wait for you to finish and then we order another round. Um, if I am down in too many beers, the cocktail server could kind of conveniently not make eye contact with me, right? There's all these ways right. in which we um, subtly, sometimes completely unconsciously, are moderating our consumption in response to social cues. And that's always how it's been. Um, you take away social cues, you take away social control, and all you're left with is a primate that's got this reward circuit that really likes to get lit up mm -hmm. and the substance that does that. And it's really hard to control your consumption when um, you're drinking alone. And so, and that's again, historically recent phenomenon that, you know, in America, you can go to a drive through liquor store and just have them load up mm -hmm. enough vodka in the back of your truck to kill a small scale society, right? Um, yeah. And you can just take that home and have it in your house and drink it whenever you want. Um, that's weird and new and dangerous. And so, and, and I think we've seen that, um, you know, a nice kind of natural experiment has been, you know, hey, let's make everyone stay at home for a year and see what happens right. <laughs> to their alcohol right. consumption. And it turns out really bad things happen. So, you know, problem drinking during the pandemic lockdowns, problem drinking got really, really bad. Um, and it's because of the removal of these social controls. And uh, I know we are running short on time, so I, I'm going to cut a couple of questions that I was going to ask, but I do encourage people when um, reading the book to look at the 
southern and northern drinking cultures mm-hmm. um, that you speak about and how the I'm going to very quickly summarize that. And I know the book does it much more justice than this will do, but the Southern culture being um, is alcohol is part of daily activity. It's part of meals. It's part, think of Italy is, is the example you use. I think Italy and Spain, if I'm correct, um, yeah. as the examples you use, it's, it's everywhere. And yet if you go to Italy, you don't see people who are drunk. There's, there's not a lot of public drunkenness. It's seen as a very, very bad thing as um dehumanizing to debase mm-hmm. yourself like that um so you just don't see it even though wine is ostensibly ubiquitous it's all around you yeah yeah um and on the flip side with uh, the northern drink culture so these are more scandinavia russia uh certainly north america and america in particular the u.s in particular as uh separating intoxication and alcohol from these social settings so you get more um you know a higher volume intake you get ones that intakes that are uh, more prone to isolation, more prone to achieving drunkenness rather than kind of uh, the session style versus a binge style is kind of how I can. Yeah. They're, yeah and they're drinking distilled liquors primarily. Exactly. And, that it's, too. and it's not entirely uh, outside of a social context, but it's an artificial social context. So it's typically male only groups who are drinking just to drink and with the express purpose of getting drunk. And where drunkenness is seen as a sign that, you know, you're one of the guys and you're cool. It's actually right. celebrated. It's kind of embarrassing to not get physically drunk. Um, and so, yeah, my argument is that, you know, you, with these different drinking cultures, what's interesting is it's, there's probably not genetic. Well, who knows? Maybe future research will show that there's genetic differences in tolerance among populations. Um, but it's likely the case that, you know, everyone everywhere there's a 15% of the population who are prone to alcoholism. Um, and yet in Italy, you have really low alcoholism rates. And even though the Italians per capita drink the most, I think, in Europe, um, they have very low alcoholism rates. And then in Russia and Scandinavia and the US, you have very high alcoholism rates. And that's got to be, I don't think it's genetic differences. I think it's that you have these different drinking cultures that um, are, some are more successful than others at allowing you to capture the benefits of alcohol without incurring too many of the costs. Right. And as, as always with these modern societies, it is the distilled liquor as opposed to natural strength beers and wines that appears to be the real tipping point between those. Yeah, two. but you can, if you have an unhealthy drinking culture, you can get you can be unhealthy on anything. I mean, you look at frat culture sure. with beer, right? Beer bombs. And um, so it's not just distilled liquors. It's the, it's the drinking to get really drunk. That's the problem. Right. So the uh, circling back to the evolutionary aspect of this, you know, even with even the most liberal estimates of distillation, as you said, we're going back a couple hundred years, um, certainly not long enough for evolution to have even seen it as a blip on the radar yeah, yeah. Uh, but scientifically speaking but a, a little is... bit a little bit longer in east asia um so right. a couple hundred years earlier and i do have colleagues who think that the reason for the preservation and spread of that flushing gene complex in asia is actually that is a genetic response to distilled liquor i have two colleagues who've argued that so it's not impossible because you know once you get China may have had distilled liquors. There's debate about this. It's possible as far back as the Tang Dynasty, so like 900 AD, maybe. Um, you start to get these smaller banquet cups that suggest that they had distilled liquor. And that's long enough for genetic evolution to do something about it. So it's, it is, this is an open question. But yeah, certainly Europeans are, aren't right. adapted to, yeah. Right. No, no, I'm, I'm even more curious about uh, East Asian Drink. I do remember you mentioning the smaller drinking cups uh, as part of the book as well. But on the flip side, so now the distilled spirits are more ubiquitous. There's, it's, they're easier to get. They're easier to imbibe. Um, there is, however, that scientific maximum that you can distill something to. As you said, you can distill vodka and spirits to, unless you're in a vacuum, to about 97% and change ABV, and you can't go any higher. Mm-hmm. Not... Uh, suggesting at all that people should start drinking Everclear. Please don't do that. Yeah. But 
But um, because there is that limiting factor that you can't go any higher with alcohol, does that then give evolution, giving evolution agency, does that give evolution the chance to kind of catch up and say, okay, you can perhaps be more genetically uh, predisposed to being able to handle those stronger alcohols over the, I don't know, the next couple of centuries. Like that's something that's Yeah, I don't know what, yeah, it'd be interesting to think about what the selection pressures would be and what the mechanism would be. Um, but it's possible, it's possible. But I mean, 90, there's no limit real. I mean, the difference between 97 and 100 still super dangerous <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna sure, mess you okay. up in a way that you know um, yeah. no beer or wine ever would but, but yeah no it's possible it could um you know and it's possible it has created adaptive pressures in east asia because it's been around long enough so yeah we could maybe start to adapt to it um but the way so if the flushing gene syndrome is an adaptation it's just a not drink right it's not an adaptation that allows you to handle 90 proof alcohol it's an adaptation that makes you hate all alcohol so and my guess would be that's the most efficient solution to this problem is rather than kind of dedicating some kind of crazy amount of machinery to um the the alcohol metabolism pathway um right. at a certain point evolution's just like screw it we're not dealing with this substance anymore. We're going to make you get really sick anytime you put it in your body. Right. And at that point, it's really, it's self-selecting by saying, as you said, the costs far outweigh the benefits and it's no longer yeah. useful to us in yeah. the same way. Uh, well, of course, as with any interview, there are so many questions that I have that uh, I will uh, maybe follow up with you on, but I don't want to hold you too much longer on this one. Last one's going to be a fun, very quick one, which is just... Okay. You, did, you mentioned a study being done uh, at the time of writing by anthropologist Robin Dunbar in Britain mm -hmm. about the importance of uh, the pub in modern British culture. And at the time of writing, it was still being done. I'm just curious if there were any updates on that and uh, if we can go out to a pub yeah. and have a little fun. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know um, what Robin's done in the last year, um, but you know, he has shown, his research group has shown that um, there are positive uh, psychological benefits to having a local. So if you have a pub that you go to regularly, um, you're less prone to depression, you've got um, various different measures of psychological health are higher. Um, he's also funded by the um, Anal Society. <laughs> His research <laughs> is funded. So, um, but he's a, he's, a, he's a really respected anthropologist and a great scientist. Um, so I'm sure the science is, is really good. Um, so yeah, they're finding that, um, again, it's about healthy drinking cultures, right? So if you have a local pub that you frequent, it's going to be, there's going to be food, there's going to be people you know, um, there's going to be um, a mix of people, so kids and old people and kids on dates and um, it just, it's a pub culture, it is a, is a, is a kind of uh, form in England of the Southern drinking culture, right? It's a, it incorporates beer in a way that um, includes everyone and helps keep drinking moderate. Um, and the evidence is that that's a, that's a positive thing. So he's one of the few people I know, he's one of the few anthropologists I know who's taking this social function of alcohol seriously and, and trying to study it. That's yes, well, I look forward to seeing the final research on that. And of course, for that leads. So Dr. Slingerland, thank you so much for coming on. Once again, distinguished university scholar and professor of Asian studies at University of British Columbia, author professor of- Professor of philosophy now, actually. Oh, uh, yes. The philosophy department, yeah. That's right, you got philosophy. Uh, and um, it was one of those, uh, that you had as well that but i don't want to i'm, I'm now i'm now psychology home in well. philosophy and then adjunct in asian studies and psychology as i said man of man of many interests <laughs> yeah. um, so author of drunk how we sip danced and stumbled our way to civilization um an excellent read um, as also author of trying not to try of course this one focused on the former uh, there'll be links to Dr. Singerland's website to uh, his uh, social media to of course purchasing this book in the show notes. Um, 
thoroughly interesting read, really an interesting read for anyone who enjoys alcohol, is interested in alcohol, and wants to understand a little bit more about how, uh, why we even started doing it in the first place and how it might yeah. still be a positive thing sometimes. So Dr. Slinglin, I will pour out a little log of in 16, if I remember correctly. Oh, yes. That's my favorite. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. I wrote that down, so I will pour a little bit out tonight to um, thank you for coming on. And with that, I will let you go. Thanks, Cheers, everyone. Thanks for having Have me. Have a great week. Bye.